Hey everyone, John Deere here from John Deere's Embroidery Legacy. For those of you who don't know me, I'm actually a fourth generation embroiderer within the industry, and I'm what's known as a Shifley baby, which essentially means I was born into this industry. My grandparents, after World War II, immigrated from Europe to Canada, and like many young immigrants at that time, they came across almost penniless with a young daughter, and they looked for whatever work they could get. Being that they had a bit of background in the embroidery industry in Europe, they found a job with a company called Grant Emblems, and they worked at Grant for many years, kind of saving and getting along. And it wasn't until 1958 when my grandfather and my grandmother decided to start their own business. Now they virtually had nothing, and they started with another couple uh, who was their partners, and they went to the Catholic Church to get a loan for a very old machine. It was actually a 1905 manual plow and shifley machine. It didn't even work on what was called an automat. There was essentially 10 yards of material spanned up on two decks, so 20 yards of material, and a person would physically digitize or punch the design, as they called it in those days, to mass produce either yard goods, lace, or emblems. And that's really where my grandparents started, was in the industry working within that sector. And that's why the name of their company was originally Dress Crest Embroidery Company Limited. It was a real mouthful, but they started doing lace goods for the bridal industry, yard goods for manufacturers, and it more and more over the years it evolved into doing emblems for the Girl Guides and Boy Scouts and all kinds of corporate things. Now it should be known also that my grandparents started the company in what was later to be a residential area. And when I ended up moving from that factory many years later, we were the only existing factory in a residential area in the city of Toronto. The reason why is we were there before the residential area was. That's how long we had worked within that area. Uh, there were bylaws so we couldn't expand, but we had to start a second factory when we grew and got larger. But that original factory was the core and most of my childhood memories actually revolve around that piece of property and that factory. When I was a child and I actually was born and grew up in the factory, my grandparents' house, which was an old farmhouse, was in the front of the property and the factory was essentially in the backyard. Uh, when I came into being in the industry, we actually had four Shifley machines running in that small factory. There were production tables with people finishing lines of emblems. Uh, there was you know clickers and marrow machines and all kinds of stuff I remember back in those days my grandparents had one order that they had for many many decades with the girl guides and they produced approximately four million brownie emblems every single year now as a child growing up in those surroundings was pretty unique and keeping in mind that it was a real European work ethic so I gotta be honest my family was either eating or sleeping or we were for the most part in the factory working some of my other childhood memories was, was actually spending hours and hours in the factory and just sitting and talking to the people who worked within the factory. My grandparents had 54 employees and they were all much like themselves, immigrants from various countries, and they worked very long hours. In my grandparents' uh, early years, we worked six days a week, in those days you did not work Sunday, and we worked two shifts. It was seven till seven, both a.m. and p.m. So the watchers and the people who were working those big machines worked 12 hours a day. And I remember as a kid going in after school and you know on weekends, and I remember sitting with Louie and Herman and you know, with Vincent and with Joey, and they were pretty much my friends. I'm pretty sure I was a little bit of a, uh, you know, pest as far as I was concerned, but they would take time and sit and talk with me. I also remember just helping out on the machines. They would actually teach me how to do color changes and how to change the colors on the rollers of the machine. They'd show me how they actually threaded the machine with a little hook behind their ear. They explained to me the principles of spanning up the machine and, and you know, basically changing changing colors and how you lined everything up. So seeing these machines run was pretty much uh, bred into me. I, there wasn't a moment or a day that I don't remember going by where I didn't see these Shifley looms just cranking out thousands of emblems. 
Now I do remember some fun times as I was a kid and actually I was pretty popular in our neighborhood. Uh, on our actual rolls of twill we actually used a drill material that we ran the emblems on. After all the material was gone we'd have these big cardboard cones I guess that came out of them and my friends and I loved playing and fighting with those like they were swords. I remember the factory which was a very old factory, an old building. We used to climb up under the top roof of the factory when I was a kid and I even remember convincing one of the employees to sew us some parachutes out of material which my friends and I then decided to jump off the top of the building. Well needless to say it did not work out very well for us but it was just a fun time and there are memories that I'll never forget. One thing I will say is that my family did instill in me a very, very strong work ethic. Being a European family that basically immigrated with nothing and basically growing a business into the 50s, 60s and 70s, uh, we worked very, very hard. It was just part of what we did as a family. Uh, I remember my mother and my grandmother and my grandfather always in the factory working. I even remember my great grandmother on the production line as I was a kid and as we were finishing all of the emblems for production. Now my grandfather who started our business, he was a true businessman and he actually did count his pennies because we were in a penny business, but I remember he had a very strong work ethic and I remember when I was 12 years old, it was basically when I was told that now you're a young man and you need to start working in the factory. Now I did go to school, but during our summer breaks, that was my job in the factory. We, we basically had a couple weeks off every year with the family and my family did travel when I was very young to some exotic places and we would relax but other than that I remember we actually worked and my first job in the factory at the age of 12 was working on something called a clicker. Now a clicker essentially cut out emblems and it had little dies and it was a hydraulic press and you use both hands and for 12 hours a day I basically knocked out emblems out of fabric. So my, my real career started as a clicker. Now I did learn pretty much every element of embroidery during the period of 12 till almost 17 years old. Every summer I worked in the factory, I worked almost every day after school, I had little various jobs, but in that time I used a clicker, I learned how to be a shuttle boy, I learned how to do mending, I learned how to do marrowing, I learned how to draft for embroidery. In those days it was very different, we didn't use computers to draft, we actually would take our paper drafts into a dark room and you'd turn off the light lights, you'd put your piece of artwork underneath the overhead camera and you would move it up or down to make it bigger or smaller and you'd physically draw your, pap your paper or your draft with pencils and rulers. So uh, much different than it is today. But I learned every aspect of embroidery, whether it was stitching or being a Shifley operator. I learned all of that by the time I was 17 years old. Thanks for watching the first of our three History of Embroidery digitizing videos. When I reflect back on those early days, it always amazes me to think about how far this beautiful art form has come. Now the funny thing is that although much has changed, a lot is still exactly the same. Yes, embroidery machines are now faster, and software makes creating designs a lot easier, but the rules behind thread and needle working with different fabric types to create beautiful embroidery is still the same, nor do I think it will ever change. It's kind of like cooking. Yes, these days there are new pans, stoves, and other cooking appliances, but your ingredients are still the same. For that reason, and to help coach and further you along in creating your own embroidery legacy, I've begun sharing some of my family's age-old embroidery secrets, tips, and tricks here on YouTube for free. In the past, I only shared these secrets at live events where customers paid to attend or with companies who paid me up to $50,000 to advise them. Rather than let these secrets die out, I'm now posting them here for you for free. So be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel now. The next step of your embroidery legacy starts here with ours. Be sure to stay tuned for our next History of Embroidery Digitizing video. Hi, John Deere here and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like down below. To join the legacy now, hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit the bell to be notified every time we release a new video. It's no mystery, award-winning embroidery is our history.